remember the last time I had a chance to come up here, I said uh, that I was going to be preaching a, uh, a series. I've never done one of those before. And the Bible offers up lots of really good opportunities for series preaching, not the least of which is uh, the, the I am statements of Jesus Christ. He claims to be certain things that if you are a believer in him, uh, you need to know. And last time we talked about his claim that he was the light of the world. And this time, uh, I would invite you to think about Jesus Christ, uh, who is the bread of life. And as we begin, uh, would you please stand and join me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. And of course, you know, we, we pray the Lord's Prayer, uh, and part of that prayer is asking for our daily bread. And what we find is that Jesus promises to be that bread, okay, uh, and there are a couple of scriptures that I would point you to this morning. First is Psalm 34, 8. David knew that the Lord was the bread of life. And he said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. That's in Psalm 34. And later in the Bible, in the Gospel of John, in the sixth chapter, beginning in the 35th verse. And there we go. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Okay. When my mom watches this on YouTube, I'm sure I'll be making her really proud right about now. <laughs> Do you live with a roll hog? You know, who's always the first one at the restaurant to help themselves to the basket of rolls or bread. And they usually ask for another basket and then force you to pass on dessert because they filled up on bread. Suffice it to say that I've missed out on my share of brownie delights for the sake of yeast rolls smothered in honey butter. It should also be noted, though, that our culture isn't the only one that puts bread at the center of our meals. Indeed, mixing flour and oil, or flour and water and yeast, making anything from a loaf to a round to a glorified cracker, glorified cracker is a time-honored staple of diets all over the world. Of course, this is no accident. 
Grain makes up the... And it even seems this is by our Heavenly Father's design, doesn't it? In Exodus 16 when the people of Israel grumbled because they were hungry. What did God send them? Bread. He sent manna from heaven to satisfy them every morning with a double measure on the day before the Sabbath to ensure that no one would have to work on his day. Exodus 16.31 tells us that manna was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers and honey. From the very beginning, God has supplied bread to sustain his people on their journey to find him. Some 450 years later, King David would record in Psalm 34 his response to the Lord's provision. In Psalm 34, 8, he wrote, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Now, I don't know about all of your circumstances, But I know mine. And I know that as I have cried out to God throughout my life, as I have surrendered myself to Him, His grace and provision have been extraordinary, beyond my understanding or even beyond all of my desires. He showers His mercies on us every day, doesn't He? Can't we, like David, call out to the world to taste and see that the Lord Our Lord is good. And shouldn't our gratitude to him for his love be the defining quality we show the world? Shouldn't we be telling everyone around us about the bounty of God's grace and the provisions he gives us for our every need? I wonder if the multitudes who Jesus fed in the sixth chapter of John told their friends all about him. I bet they did. John records that about 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children who were with them, had gathered to hear Jesus teach. It was the Passover, and many had traveled a great distance, so Jesus had compassion on the crowd. He had them sit down on the hillside where he gave thanks to his father and where he took five loaves and two fish and fed them all. I was barely able to get six girls fed. The crowd was so taken by this gesture, by this miracle, that they wanted to make Jesus their king right there on the spot. Of course, he wasn't interested in an earthly kingdom, was he? No. We see Jesus turn his disciples' hearts and the hearts of the people around him toward his eternal intentions a bit later in John 6 when he confronts them and their worldly mindset. He sees through the crowd's desire for him to be their worldly king when he tells them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. He continues, Jesus does, by giving them the very clearest explanation in the entire Bible about what they are to do as people of the kingdom. To do the work of God. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Churches have been arguing about the work of God for 2,000 years to this day. And they split and they argue and they split and they argue and they split and they argue. And we argue about whether or not we should have more social ministry and, you know, whether the whether it needs to be juice or wine and what kind of bread you're supposed to use. Here's what Jesus said. To do the work of God is to believe in him whom he has sent. Period. That's it. I truly, I find it truly fascinating that God not only provides our bread to energize us for work, 
but he provides the work as well. He doesn't just feed us and say, go out and do good stuff. He tells us what the bread of life is, and he tells us what we're to do as we're energized by it. The only work that truly matters is the bolstering of our faith in Christ Jesus. And that work doubles as the key ingredient of the bread of life. Of course, this is hard work. As if to prove just how difficult it truly is to believe in Jesus on your own, John reports that the people immediately began asking Jesus for more signs of his deity. This is just one of the situations where I imagine Jesus just shaking his head. As he explains that even though he just fed upwards of 5,000 people with a little more than crumbs, earthly bread isn't the point. God has sent heavenly bread to us that strengthens and preserves us for eternity. It gives us life forever. Jesus sets himself apart as the bread of life, as the eternal heavenly manna, the bread of the Passover. In declaring himself the bread of life, Christ declares his place as the single primary source of eternal nourishment. He is given to us by his Father so that all who believe in him might have eternal life. I think it's interesting that Jesus reveals himself as the bread of life while in the company of so many who don't believe in him. As he explains and acknowledges that only those who the Father draws to him will be saved, apparently leaving out many who were standing on the hillside with him, he very clearly shares that everyone who is given to him, who believes in him, will be raised again on the last day. Bless you. Seeing this tension between belief and unbelief is at the very center of our struggle as Christians, isn't it? At least I know it is for me. As I read the scripture from John 6 to prepare for this morning, I was forced to consider my place, my standing with Jesus, and I was left with only gratitude. You see, all we can do, all I can do, is outwardly express the faith that God gives us. Without his grace supplying the very faith that saves us, we are nothing. Again, we see that as he supplied the very bread of heaven, our salvation is the eating of it. We don't make the bread. We don't sell the bread. We don't harvest the grain. We simply have to trust that the bread is what Jesus says it is and eat of it. The desire of our hearts to know Jesus and to trust him as our Savior is a desire given by God and nurtured by Christ as he sacrifices himself for us, making himself the bread of life for us. Now, we can only seek after this bread. You can only come to this table and get its value if we die to the world. Luckily for us, I guess, we're already dead in our sins. The question for us is whether we are willing to confess to being dead. That death is what God uses to create a hunger for Christ. As we are convicted of sin, as we see Christ hanging on the cross, we are drawn to him, aren't we? The more we realize our deadness, the hungrier we get for the bread of life, if we are Jesus's. This teaching that Jesus is the very bread of life is so important that Jesus repeats this claim four times during his conversation with the people. And folks, if there's anything I've learned from studying the Bible, that which is repeated is important. Four times in a passage means it's really important. And we're going to touch on two things that were repeated by Jesus four times, all in the sixth chapter of John. 
Here we go. First he says, I am the bread of life. A couple sentences later, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Two or three verses later, he repeats, I am the bread of life. For those of you that weren't listening the first time. Then, finally, he tells them that I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. I especially wanted to preach on this particular I am statement today because we're celebrating the Lord's Supper. It is in this meal that we are reminded of Christ's sacrifice and where we are strengthened and preserved through Christ's body and blood to life everlasting. As important as this meal, this communion is, it behooves us to know what Jesus said about his body and blood and what miracles God works through them. Jesus begins by drawing a comparison for us. He tells us in John 6.35 that whoever eats his flesh and drinks the blood of his sacrifice will never hunger or thirst. If you've lived on this planet for just a matter of minutes, you know what it means to be hungry and thirsty. Indeed, those feelings are usually among the very first we communicate to our mothers, aren't they? In this pronouncement, though, Jesus isn't claiming that our stomachs will never growl again, but rather that in him, our spirits will find all of the nourishment they will ever need. And here's the comparison I spoke of. As physically hungry as the world is, as so many of our neighbors are, we see as believers the much more evident spiritual hunger, even starvation, of the hearts and souls around us, don't we? Part of the comfort we find in this heavenly food is that as we eat it, Jesus promises that we will always be his. He tells us in John 6, 37, that all those whom the Father gives me, that's us guys, the ones who come to this table and eat and drink, all of those will come to him, and he who comes to me, I will in no way throw out. If you've ever thought that Christ couldn't possibly love you or save you, I encourage you to come to this meal today and believe, even with the faith of a mustard seed. Believe that this bread and drink are Christ's promise to you that he loves you and that he will love you forever. And how does Jesus show this love to us? By promising us that he will raise us on the last day to spend eternity with him. This is such a pivotal promise that he again repeats himself four times in the space of 18 verses. In John 6, verse 40, Jesus says that if we see the Son, you're looking at him. In the bread and the drink. Okay, he's already said that. I'm the bread of life. The bread that I give is my flesh. You're going to have to drink my blood of my sacrifice for you. So we've already determined that. Okay? All right, so if we see the Son and believe, we will have eternal life and be raised on the last day. In verse 51, he continues, if we eat of the living bread, we live forever. Later on, he says, everyone who eats Christ's flesh and drinks his blood, in verse 54, has eternal life. And finally, in verse 58, he proclaims that the living bread unlike the manna of the Old Covenant, gives eternal life. Clearly, Christ wants us to understand the connection between his sacrifice, our belief in him, 
and the promise of eternal life. Taste, he says, and see that the Lord is good. A promise as wondrous as this must still come at a price, a price only God's Son could pay. And Jesus knew this would upset the world. He knew that there were and are people who want what he promises but can't bring themselves to give over their dead existences to him, can't bring themselves to trust him for the eternal life that he offers. The work of heaven, believing in God's Son, is an impossible task if we try to do it on our own. We don't simply eat this bread or drink this drink to satisfy our hunger. No, we come trusting that Christ's claims are true and that the sacrifice of his body and blood and our eating of them in body and spirit are keys to an eternal heavenly kingdom that only Christ can unlock. Jesus repeatedly reminds us that unless we come to him with believing hearts and acknowledging him as our Savior and Redeemer, especially as we eat and drink his body and blood, we can have no part of his heavenly kingdom. The amazing and beautiful thing about communion, for me, is that in it, Jesus comes to us across 2,000 years and many, many miles to announce his love for us. He comes today to Pleasant Ridge Baptist Church as the very living bread, the very bread of life. He comes calling you to believe in him, in his sacrifice, and in his love for you. He comes offering himself and saying, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who seek refuge in him. title this morning is it truly is or truly can be a wonderful life I'm going to ask that you follow along with me as we read the story of the birth of Christ 